We are running our race. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Let's bring you back up to speed. Uh, you know, the Christian life is also compared to a boxing or a wrestling match. Now, we're not talking about Channel 4 on Friday night, SmackDown, or none of that stuff. But what we're talking about is a, a real wrestling match. Ephesians 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26, the last part of that, said, that verse says, So fight, not as one that beateth the air. You know, we need to realize that we're in a battle. Paul wants them to realize that they haven't achieved. Paul hadn't achieved. That's what he's telling them. Hey, I haven't achieved anything. All the things that I've done, whatever I did yesterday, it don't mean nothing. But it's what I'm doing today and what I'm going to do in the days to come that are going to matter. The past is exactly what it is. The past. We can't change it. We can't turn it around. But it is exactly what it is. It's the past. It's all history. We'd be better off looking at today and looking forward than not always remembering in the past back here. You know, our salvation is merely the start of our race for Christ. It begins there. That's our starting line, if you, if you will, is, the, is our salvation. The race that we run is not a sprint, except, unfortunately, this is the way that many Christians live their lives, just like it's a sprint. They briefly live for Christ. And then it seems like they poop out or give up on serving Him. Too many have been like the Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul said, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You know, our race is a marathon. A long distance race that lasts for a lifetime and must be pursued with patience. Why should you or I make this continuous all out effort? Paul tells us that he did it so that he may apprehend, grasp, seize, or lay hold of the things of Christ. Paul says that he's trying to grasp that which he has been grasped by Christ. The same thing that Christ has or did or achieved, that's what Paul wants to do. And that's what he's telling them here in verse 12. He's telling them that my race ain't over yet. I'm still running my race here. So if I'm still running mine, and I'm still I'm sitting here in prison writing this to you, then doesn't that tell you anything? That your race is not over. You're just in this thing. It's a marathon. You gotta keep running. That's what Paul's telling the church here in Philippi. These Philippian people. He's telling them that if I haven't finished, then neither of you. Paul felt that with 
that when Christ stopped him on the Damascus road, that he had a purpose for Paul. And Paul pressed onward for fear of one thing. I don't believe, I don't believe Paul feared any government or he feared what any authority could do to him. He feared one thing in his life from the Damascus Road forward, and that was failing Christ. That's the only thing that Paul feared. He didn't want to fail. He did not want to fail Christ. You know, every Christian is grasped by the Lord Jesus Christ for some purpose or another. Therefore, every man or woman should press onward their entire life that they might lay hold on that purpose for which Christ has grasped them. That's you and I. That's what he's telling the church in Philippi. That's what he's telling us. The same thing. God lays hold of all believers for two key purposes. Holiness and usefulness. These cannot be accomplished apart from a full surrender to the Lord Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. John 15, in verse 16. He says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, He may give it you. We are saved to glorify Christ and to let Him live His life in and through each of us. Because our life's not our own. The day that we trust Jesus that we ask Him to be Savior of our life, to come into our heart and put up a residence there, we're not our own. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us, we are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. But we're not our creation. We're His creation. And it boils down to the, to the very question of is our life counting for Christ? Is what we're doing counting for Christ? Is our race that we're running worthy of Christ? Not only should our prayer be, Lord, use me, but it also should be, Lord, make me usable. There's a difference. There is no tragedy so great as a Christian at the end of life's journey to have the bitter knowledge that he or she has failed to achieve that which his Lord has saved him for. None of us are there yet. I mean, we're not at the end of our race. But you know, if you ever if you if you do some contemplating upon that, of course we you know we don't know when our race is going to end anyway. But still, wouldn't you like to? It'd be better to have the thinking in your heart that Lord, I did the, I ran the best race I I could have run, than it would be to think about what you could have done or should have done for Christ Jesus. Because I guarantee you, those questions are going to confront every born-again believer at the judgment. 
of what we could have or should have or what we did do when we had the opportunity to do it. What a shame it'll be at the judgment seat of Christ for Christians who missed the mark and wasted their opportunities to serve the Lord. What glory there will be for people like Paul who pursued, who pursued their course with enthusiasm and determination and finished what God wanted them to do. Paul finished his race for God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul wrote, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That ought to be what every Christian would want to be able to say. So we look and we continue. In verses 13 and 14, we find the aspiration and the aim of Paul. He says, brethren. He now he says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are where? Behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press, verse 14, towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, you know, Forget that stuff back here. And if we put it in today's world, we all got baggage. Every one of us got baggage. Now we can either pick that bag up and carry it everywhere we go, or we can let it go. Our society today has got a lot of baggage. But it seems like people want to carry that bag everywhere they go. You know, we come to the secret. And it is the secret of Paul's great success as a Christian. Paul had a passion to reach the goal as quickly as possible letting nothing divert his attention from that goal. You know, when, when a runner runs a race, whether it's... Think of how hard it would be to run a marathon if you knew where your starting line was, but you never knew where the ending was. Whether it was 26 miles, 30 miles, 35 miles, 50 miles, if you could run that far. But just think, you took off, you're running your race, but you have no idea where, where or how far you got to go. A sprinter, you know, he starts in the starting blocks, and there's a tape down here, 100 meters down, 220 meters, 440 me, uh, or the 400 yard, you know, one complete revolution around the track. He knows, all right, I got to start here. I got to go here. This is how far I got to go. That's what they train for. And they train that they can push themselves, that they can give all that they have in the confines of point A starting and point B finishing. Now, Paul... That was his success. Nothing was going to divert him. You don't see a sprinter get down in their blocks and boil their up, you know, and then they raise their butt up off the ground, you know, like this, and, and they get down there and then the gun takes off and 
You don't see any of them people looking around like, oh, I wonder what this guy's doing. Man, where do you get them shoes at? I wish I had some shoes like that. Or whatever. Man, their whole thing is concentrated on their race. And when the gun goes off and their head comes up, the only thing they're looking at is the finish line. Unless you're the dude that's way out in front of everybody. And then you'll see them kind of look around to see where everybody else is. Paul didn't let anything divert from him from looking towards his finish line. We all got a finish line, folks. Now, some of us are going to hit our finish line before others. There are some young people out there today that are going to hit their finish line before some of us older folks get to ours. But we all have a finish line. We all need to be concentrating on our finish. We may not have started well. You can see some of those races where they're running, and those runners, they, and maybe it's it's a it's a longer race, you know, like a two twenty or the four hundred, whatever it is, and they don't get a real good start out of the blocks, but they know that hey, I still got time to make it up. That's what that's like. That's how Paul looked at things. He didn't start well, even though he was a Hebrew, the Hebrews, the Pharisee, the Pharisee, a Roman citizen, and he was all that stuff, uh, ordained, given to persecute the church, and he, of course he did that with all with the zeal of that no one else could match. But he didn't start well. But he wanted to finish well in his life. He's telling the Philippians same thing. Hey, I'm, I'm pressing towards the mark. I want you to press towards that same mark. He didn't claim to have arrived in his spiritual growth and accomplishment. He, he knew that there was more to be done. He knew that he had never reached completion yet. He's still in the oven. He's still baking. And at times when the, the, uh, the grand baker of all stuck that toothpick in him and when he pulled it out, it was still a little dirty. He hadn't quite reached where he needed to be yet. But he kept running. He kept going. That's what we needed to do. Paul continues and he says, but this one thing I do. He shows that his attitude was fixed on one absorbing, overmastering devotion. He was concentrating on one thing. Nothing was permitted to turn his heart from an all-out effort to know Christ and to make Christ known to other people. We're all learning. Paul was steadily learning. He was steadily going. Steadily seeking to improve. In Scripture, there were there are some one things of Scripture. You know, Paul knew this one thing I know. There are some one things. Joshua 23, 14. One thing of God's loyalty to us. And behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Psalm 27, 4. The one thing of longing or desire. One thing have I desired of the Lord, 
that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Mark 10, verse 21. The one thing that is lacking. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. The one thing of the length of God's timetable. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The one thing of learning at Jesus' feet. Luke 10, verse 42. It says, but one thing is needful, Jesus said, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary was devoted to sitting at Jesus' feet to learn from Him. He commended her of her choice. I'm just wondering if we're still learning from the Lord. This one thing that is very needful today is that we need to continue learning from the Lord. Too many Christians involved in too many things when the secret of progress is to concentrate on one thing. We are to keep our focus on the goal of living for the Lord Jesus. Many get caught out. They get out there and they and they get to going on uh, uh, too many other things. Too much in life. Too many, too many things taking up time. But we need to concentrate on the one thing. That's what Paul's telling the church in Philippi. That's what he's telling you and I. We need to concentrate on one thing, one goal, one focus, and that's Christ Jesus. Um, remember the camp meeting on at 7 o'clock every, every night, the remainder of this week. You can go back when you get home or whatever the case is. You know, it may be... 9, 9 30 when it's over or whatever and you can watch it or watch it tomorrow or whatever uh, tonight's service and, and those things and uh, and then uh, of course next week uh, during the midweek service we'll have business meetings so uh, let's pray and we can be dismissed this evening dear Lord we do come thanking you Lord for your many blessings Lord, forgive us where we fail you so often and so much. And Lord, uh, continue to, to help our focus, Lord. Give us spiritual blinders, Lord, that will block out the things that are around, Lord, and let us concentrate on the thing that lies before us. And that's doing your work and your service. Lord, uh, just be with our prayer list. And each and every petition that was mentioned and the ones that weren't. And Lord, uh, we ask that you would have your will and way in each and every one of those. As the great physician that you are, Lord, we know that uh, if you so deem that you can do as you please in each and every one of these, and Lord, we'll just thank you for what you do. Lord, just uh, continue to be with us through the remainder of this week. Bring us back into your into your house again this coming weekend, Lord. Uh, prepared to to worship and to honor you, Lord, as we come back into your sanctuary. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord, from the very bottom of our heart. And it's in 
the Lord Jesus Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.